Hello, and welcome to American Catholic History, brought to you by the support of listeners like you. If you like this podcast and would like to support our work, please visit AmericanCatholicHistory.org slash support. I'm Noelle Heaster Crow. And I'm Tom Crow. Today we're talking about Bloody Monday in Louisville, Kentucky, August 6th, 1855. Yeah, this is another episode brought to us by our old friends, the Know Nothings. Keep coming back. Yeah, they do. And this is one of their most spectacular offenses, probably their highest body count, and it certainly includes some of the most horrific things that they did. Yeah, the only episode that really compares is the riots in Philadelphia in 1844. Those riots also had a high death toll, and lots of Catholics' homes and businesses were burned down. Plus two Catholic churches. Right. Yeah, so it's maybe a close call to say which is worse, but there's no question they both were awful. Sure. Though one big difference was the motivation. In Philadelphia, the fight happened over which version of the Bible should be used in public schools. Imagine that. While in Louisville, it was over whether or not Catholics should be allowed to vote. But one thing we can say with certainty, Louisville is a great town to visit nowadays, and you can see it yourself if you join us on pilgrimage in August of 2023 when we lead a group to the Kentucky Holy Land and Bourbon Country. Our hotel is on the outskirts of Louisville, and we spend portions of two days in town visiting some of the amazing historic churches that we're going to talk about in this episode and a couple of distilleries. Yes. And one thing I didn't realize the last time we were in Louisville is that the marker commemorating the Bloody Monday riots is just a few blocks down Main Street from the Evan Williams experience. Maybe we'll have lunch down that direction next time we're there. (laughs) I mean, maybe, though it is the other direction from Angel's Envy, which is another distillery we'll visit. So it might be a little out of the way, but, you know, we'll see what works. We'll see what works. Yeah. Anyhow, come with us on this pilgrimage. Get details at AmericanCatholicHistory.org slash pilgrimages. But getting back to the Bloody Monday riots themselves. Yeah. So we'll start with some background. Louisville, Kentucky had been established on the Ohio River in the late 1700s, near where the Falls of Ohio made passage by boat treacherous, if not impossible. The Ohio River was already a vital shipping route, but at this point, until canals and locks were built to allow navigation around the falls, boats had to be unloaded at one end of the falls, the cargo taken overland to the other end, where they were put back onto boats, whether the same boat or other boats. Naturally, the community near this vital cargo transfer point grew rapidly, as commerce on the Ohio River increased. Through the early 19th century, the population grew rapidly. So rapidly, in fact, that by 1850, Louisville was the 10th largest city in the nation. Meanwhile, Bardstown had remained a quaint little town of a few hundred to a few thousand. And it is very quaint. Yes. (laughs) So the church moved the seat of the diocese from Bardstown, about 40 miles north by northwest, to Louisville in 1841. That was just 33 years after Bardstown had been established as the first inland Catholic diocese. But with the rapid increase in population in Louisville, the move made good sense. Yeah, the move also made sense because so many of the people moving to Louisville were German and Irish immigrants, and most of them were Catholic. Right. Irish Catholics were leaving Ireland to escape both the general political oppression and, in the 1840s and 50s, the potato famine. German Catholics were fleeing the frequent wars and revolutions that caused problems for Catholics in the Germanic areas of Europe. Cincinnati and Louisville, among other towns, welcomed great influxes of German-speaking immigrants. During the 1830s, these German immigrants built St. Boniface Church near downtown Louisville. St. Boniface is the oldest parish in Louisville today that still has its original name, though the present church only dates to the 1890s, so it's, you know fairly young. A few years later, St. Martin of Tours was built just a few blocks from St. Boniface. St. Martin, also built for and by Germans, houses the remains of two third-century Roman martyrs. And while it is a slightly younger parish, St. Martin still has its original building from 1853. The oldest parish in the city is the Cathedral of the Assumption, but it was originally St. Louis, with the name changing in the 18 or St. Louis, with the name changing the 1840s when it became the cathedral and the present church was built. Mm -hmm. And we should mention that we actually did an episode on St. Martin and how those those martyrs ended up there. It was a great episode. (laughs) Uh, And we mentioned all three of these churches because on our pilgrimage next August, we will visit the cathedral for sure. And we will go to at least one of the other two. 
probably both of them, actually, depending on time. They're all magnificent churches, and we hope to share them with you and pray at the tombs of these saints. So register to join us. Anyhow, we bring all of that up not only to talk about the pilgrimage, but also because these churches, especially St. Martin, figure into the Bloody Monday riots. Yeah, so... That's some of the pertinent history of Louisville. The other part of the pertinent history is that the Irish and German Catholics weren't the only ones living there, and they certainly weren't the first, nor were they in the majority. No, the city had grown originally through the labors and organization of Protestants. Now, this is a fairly unremarkable fact overall. There were plenty of Protestants who didn't give much thought to whether immigrants were Catholic or Protestant, provided they were willing to be good citizens. But there were a decent number of Protestants who feared the swelling number of Catholics. They feared, literally, that Catholics would eventually get a majority and would vote to make the U.S. officially Catholic. Some of their propaganda even claimed that Catholics had a secret plot to have the Pope come over the ocean and establish a new papal monarchy here in America. Perish the thought. They feared that insane prospect. And if you know your Master Yoda, you know that fear leads to anger, anger leads to hate, and hate leads to suffering. Well, these proto-Jack Chicks had the first two steps down, but they didn't grasp how the third step would apply to themselves. Yoda makes an appearance in American Catholic history, which is appropriate working with SQPN, so... That is true. <laughs> For all of our techie fans out yes. there. Anyhow, rather than check their fear, anger, and hate, a large number of these nativist Protestants organized into political parties in various cities and states. They called themselves the American Party. But they didn't just engage in political campaigns. They let that hate inspire violent acts meant to scare Catholics away. We've talked about a few instances of this violence in previous episodes. Father John Babst, S.J., was tarred and feathered by these nativists in Maine in the 1850s. The slab of marble which Pope Pius IX sent over to be included in the Washington Monument was stolen and destroyed by these nativists, to know-nothings. And as we mentioned before, nativists rioted in Philadelphia in 1844 and caused great destruction and some loss of life. There were many other smaller acts of violence and vandalism all across the country, and though everyone knew who had done it, when a member of the American Party was questioned about what had happened, he would simply say, I know nothing. And thus they became known as the Know Nothings. At times, the Know Nothings, who had perpetrated some mischief, would be aided by other Know Nothings who were judges, prosecutors, or somewhere else in the halls of power. Sometimes the only people with knowledge of the incident were fellow Know Nothings, and so the secret remained safe. Well, Louisville was one such city where enough Protestants had become sufficiently alarmed by the growth of the Catholic numbers, and so a healthy cadre of Know Nothings developed. And in 1855, things came to a head. Election Day was on Monday, August 6th that year. The polls opened, but the polling locations were almost immediately blocked by scores of know-nothing ruffians who would not let anyone in to vote who was not able to give their passcode or sign. Many who tried to get in were beaten. As some tried to force their way past the sentries, more violence broke out. And before long, Donnybrooks were breaking out across the city. But the know-nothings who had planned for mayhem had come prepared and willing to inflict damage. And boy, did they. Yeah. The Louisville Daily Journal from the following day, August 7th, carried an extensive report of the savagery. It reads, in part, At the 7th Ward, we discovered that for three hours in the outset in the morning, it was impossible for those not posted to vote without the greatest difficulty. In the Sixth Ward, a party of bullies were masters of the polls. We saw two foreigners driven from the polls, forced to run a gauntlet, beaten unmercifully, stoned, and stabbed. In the case of one fellow, the Honorable William Thomason, formerly a member of Congress from this district, interfered, and while appealing to the maddened crown to cease their acts of disorder and violence, Mr. Thomason was struck from behind and beat. His gray hairs, his long public service, his manly presence, and his thorough Americanism availed nothing with the crazed mob. Other and serious fights occurred in the Sixth Ward, of which we have no time to make mention now. Later, they tell of shootings, more stabbings, and severe beatings. After dusk, a set of row houses known as Quinn's Row was set on fire. It was known as a place where Irish Catholics lived, and the know-nothing stood guard around it to shoot anyone who tried to escape. 
Mr. Quinn, the owner, lived in the row houses himself, and he was shot as he came out. The Know Nothing seized him and threw him, still living, back into the inferno. Earlier in the day, about 4 p.m., the mob had moved toward the recently completed St. Martin of Tours parish. But the mayor of the city, though himself a Know Nothing, prevailed upon them to spare that splendid edifice. He also convinced them to spare the Cathedral of the Assumption, and it was only his intervention which eventually quelled the violence later that night. By the time the mob stopped its mayhem, 22 were known to have died, though the number was likely much higher. Some say it was well over 100, with bodies untold among the ashes of the torched homes. The fire lasted well into the night as the intense flames consuming Quinn's row house spread to neighboring structures. All in all, more than 100 structures were burned. The report by the Louisville Daily Journal concluded with, Upon the proceedings of yesterday and last night, we have no time nor heart now to comment. We are sickened with the very thought of the men murdered and houses burned and pillaged that signaled the American victory yesterday. The very next day, the Bishop of Louisville, Martin John Spaulding, joined with Protestant leaders in the city to call for calm and peace and to reject revenge or further violence. For himself, Bishop Spaulding wrote, I entreat all to pause and reflect, to commit no violence, to believe no idle rumor, and to cultivate that peace and love which are characteristics of the religion of Christ. No one was ever prosecuted for the arson, murder, violence, or even the election interference. But the effect on the city was dramatic. Hundreds fled to other cities, Chicago, St. Louis, and smaller communities further west. Immigration into the city stalled. The significant drop in population caused the city's economy to stagnate. Dozens of businesses closed. Many of the buildings burned that awful day remained untouched for years, serving as a constant reminder of what can happen when fear turns into hatred and hatred remains unchecked. Louisville recovered somewhat in the 1860s due to the increased commerce during the Civil War. The city was occupied by northern troops, it never saw the destruction of any major battles, and it served as an important port for supplies and the Underground Railroad. But the lingering effects of Bloody Monday likely led to Louisville diminishing, while other cities along the Ohio and Mississippi, like Cincinnati and St. Louis, eventually eclipsing it in size and wealth. As for the life of the church in Louisville, well, the know-nothings couldn't end that, as you'll see when you join us on pilgrimage. The cathedral and the parishes of St. Boniface and St. Martin still stand to tell their stories of the history of the church in this part of the country. The know-nothings more or less ceased to exist at the end of the 1850s. First, because episodes like Bloody Monday so horrified most Americans that the know-nothings lost membership and support. But also, with the onset of the Civil War, non-Catholic Americans witnessed Catholics serving honorably during that fight. No one could seriously question their allegiance again. This has been American Catholic History. If you enjoy American Catholic History, please become a supporter. We've got great perks for supporters, including exclusive content, books, mugs, and personal conversations. Get information on how to become a supporter and the perks of being a supporter at AmericanCatholicHistory.org slash support. Also on our website, sign up for our newsletter, learn more about Bloody Monday, see about our pilgrimages, like our pilgrimage to the Kentucky Holy Land and Bourbon Country, and find other episodes that you might be interested in, like our episode on St. Martin of Tours. Yeah. We love getting your feedback and suggestions for episodes. You can email us at feedback at americancatholichistory.org. Find us on Facebook at facebook.com slash americancatholichistory, on Instagram at ACH underscore podcast, or follow us on Twitter at ACH1513. I'm Noelle Heaster Crow. And I'm Tom Crow. Thank you once again for joining us on American Catholic History, made possible by listeners like you.